Well, good evening. I'm Bill Rue, and I'm pleased to be here on behalf of GE Digital. So this is the last segment, um, but an important segment, because this, uh, this is the Legendary Leader Award. And of course, this is about a person who has provided inspirational leadership, but they've also contributed to others' innovation and success. So when you look at someone, the Churchill Club has asked for people who can envision a brand new future. They talk about people who frame professional and societal needs and create solutions in unique ways. And equally important is this ability to develop talent, spur contributions from the people along the way. So uh, it's really my great pleasure uh, to invite John Hennessy up to be this year's legendary leader. John, please come on up. Thanks, Bill. Congratulations. Thank you. And here's your bowler hat. Yeah. So. Thank you. So when I, I, I asked John, you know, what he wants said in his bio, and he's, he's very humble about sort of just, uh, you know, make it short. And, you know, just to kick this off, because this is going to be a discussion on leadership and inspiration, it's hard to imagine, you know, 10th uh, president of Stanford, all the boards, you've started companies, you've impacted so many lives. Maybe a good place to start is... Uh, what, who inspired you or what inspired you? What are things you've learned along the way from others? So I, I think probably the first probably is I'm a voracious reader. That was something my mother gave me a passion for. And I've found along the way the easiest way to learn the hard lessons of life is to read about somebody else who addressed those hard lessons. So I, I started with that. I had great mentors um, dating back to my high school days where uh, my high school math teacher at a parent-teacher conference said, John has a very fine mind, but he has a lazy mind. And she was exactly right. <laughs> I was lazy at that point. And she, she inspired me to work harder and gave me the opportunity to work harder. So I have a great mentor, as far as Basket, a longtime resident of the Valley who was my senior faculty mentor when I first came to Stanford. I've really tried to benefit from, from all the guidance and advice I've gotten along the way. You know, you, you quoted Abraham Lincoln quite a bit. Yeah. Did, is that someone that has inspired you and, and you've yeah. read a lot about? I, I wish, I mean, I think, I wish he were alive today because we'd be in much better shape. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, look at, look at, he takes this cabinet where everybody on his cabinet believes they're better than he is. They're better, especially Edward Stanton, who, yeah. who basically makes some remarks about the president, were, which were not gratifying at all. Um, and he transforms that cabinet into a working organization that can lead the country through its greatest crisis since the revolution. I mean, a remarkable, remarkable. Look, the Gettysburg Address, 270 words. You show me another speech of that length that had such depth, pathos, and pathos and commitment. I, I was quite taken by the examples you used of what he did, the Homestead Act yeah, and things Homestead. like that. He made the West. Yeah. He made the West. And, and, it's, and you know, we get, we get fixated on one area of inspiration, but people often have done it continuously in many different areas, uh, always striving to make change. And, and so, you know, learning seems to be a big part of, of your inspiration from, from others. Um, you know, tell us, you know, I think, we live in a world today where uh, leadership's getting redefined, not always for the best. Um, you know, what's your view of leaders? What's, what's your view of what makes a great leader? What can we learn from that? Well, I think there's some things. Obviously, innovation is part of it, but then you get to issues like compassion, courage, commitment, collaboration, things we heard about tonight. Those are critical, critical ingredients. Empathy. The ability to bring people together and inspire them to go to a place they know they need to go, they want to go, but they're afraid to go, perhaps. They're cautious about it. 
And I think great leaders have the ability to guide organizations and the institutions that lead through those times. And you know, you're, in, you're on these great boards these days. How do you, how do you imagine you know, members of the board, how, you know, what, is, what is their really responsibility and, and how do you think about inspiring the leader of that company? What's yeah. the relationship you gotta have? It's a good question because I think there, there are two parts of, of being a board member. One is the fiduciary responsibility that comes with making sure that the management is doing the right thing, is guiding the company right, and that you're not going to have an Equifax like disaster on yeah. your hands, right? Uh, but the more, the more important and the more difficult is how can the board help management think about the long term? You know, you heard a John Seeley Brown talk up here about that getting Jeff Bezos' ability to focus on the long term, focus on the future. How can the board help? The management team, think about the strategy. Not just the next quarterly report. We've become such victims of quarterly earnings reports. That's the worst possible way to manage a company. We have to think long-term. We've got to think about a long-term commitment, a commitment to the shareholders. So big fascination now on the, the commitment to shareholders. But there are two other stakeholders that are absolutely crucial, and that's the customers and the employees. And in the long term... If you, if, you, if you don't make those two groups happy as well, you're not going to have a viable company. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we can, I think, learn a little bit the discussion, you know, about Amazon and the focus on the customer and, and so on. Do you think that, uh, you know, that, that the idea you can, can you ever over-focus on that, on the customer? I don't know if you can, I think, here I, I think of a, a famous quote that Steve Jobs once said where he said, I don't ask the customers what the next product should look like because they don't know. There's a certain element to inventing the future that probably requires you to look beyond the horizon that a customer might have. Um, and so you want to build that product that amazes the customer when they see it, even though they've never thought about it. Yeah, I think that's, that's true, and I just think about the Kindle. There were other products Kindle, that were like that, yeah, but they sure. never achieved that kind of success. So there's something about you have to both con at the same time lead your customers and figure out what they, where they want to go to, skate to where the puck's going to be, if sure. you will. And timing. Timing is crucial in the technology business. Timing is crucial, right? There were other PDAs before the iPhone, but the technology perhaps wasn't all right there. It wasn't cost effective yet. And I think that's something that's a constant theme. Being in the right place at the right time uh, does make a difference. So what innovations that you've had and been involved with are you most proud about? You know, certainly, certainly um, rethinking, uh, you know, when I was a researcher, re rethinking how computer architecture would look in the future, I think, which was um, something we just started as a brainstorming exercise, given that uh, technology was moving along, single chip microprocessors were going to be dominant. Rethink how we design, uh, how we design computers. I, I think the other things I've tried to emphasize in thinking about the future of the university is the really big problems we face in the world are not going to be solved by one great scholar working with three graduate students in isolation. They're going to be solved by collaborations across those, whether it's climate change, peace and security, nuclear proliferation, health care. These are big issues, tough problems. Thinking about how to restructure the university so that it can bring together its skills from different venues, from different different disciplines and put them together. I think that's something I put a lot of emphasis on and we've begun to get real traction on. You know, one of the things I, you know, always strikes me about the very best leaders is they, they always embrace their, their failures or, and, and they, you know, the best leaders, they'll admit they never were successful at everything. Uh, Lincoln's a great example. They embrace the failure and get better as they go. You know, do you, things you've, challenges you've had and how you went through those. And yeah. in those dark days, what do you do? Well, so we, we had an interesting uh, discussion with the city of New York many years ago about building a campus in, in New York City. <laughs> it, it didn't work out in the end. It, we couldn't get on the same page. 
we, we failed to convince them that some of the core principles we had that were key to making it happen were acceptable. And they failed to convince us that they understood how universities work. So we, <laughs> we didn't get quite on the same page. Um, we invest a lot of energy and a lot of money. I had a vision that it was time for universities to think about being in more than one physical place. Yep. That you didn't have to confine yourself to one physical place, which all the great universities of the world have essentially done to date. And we were willing to try something radically new, um, but we just couldn't get there in all the pieces. I, I'm, I don't regret that we tried it. I think it was a noble effort. It was an interesting experiment, and it would have been great if it worked out. On the other hand, I'm glad I'm in California. <laughs> <laughs> Did something else come out of it? A lot of times you, we see when people find that failure occurs, you know, when, when one door op closes, a window opens. Did something come out of it? Did you I go think someplace else? One thing that did come out of yeah. it was a big a growth and in investment in online learning because we realized that if we were going to have a campus in New York and a campus in California and we were going to have students taking courses crosswise from both places, that we were going to have to invest in that technology. So that's something we began to ramp up when the first MOOCs occurred. Uh, I think it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing experiment. It's an ongoing lesson. Um, human learning, the one thing we've discovered is human learning is a lot more complicated than simply programming a computer to treat every single person as the same. So it's an ongoing, but I think it's an ongoing critical area and something we, we need to continue to invest in. Did all your, your faculty say, this is great, I'm so glad we're doing it? Well, I had to coach some along, of course. You know, it, you can't, um, when you try something that's radical, everybody doesn't jump on board. And you as a leader need to understand what are their concerns? What are they worried about? So the big thing that my faculty were worried about at Stanford if we did something in New York was we would have a B campus. And there would be faculty at the B campus, and then there would be the core campus, and all the great people would be at the core campus. And they didn't want to have a second tier faculty. So we had to think about ways to bridge that gap and, and say, that's not going to be the case. We're going to have one computer science department, and it's going to have 50 faculty here, and it's going to have 10 faculty back east. It was a radically different view of how to organize the university. You're, you're often called the godfather of Silicon Valley. I'm not uh, old enough to be the yeah. godfather of Silicon Valley. <laughs> that's, a, that's great. Uh, but, you know, uh, so, you, you know, you've seen, you've seen a lot of leadership. You've seen a lot of startups. So give me a sense. Today, you think uh, these leaders of these innovative companies that are coming along, are we, are we better leaders coming out? Are we worse? Are we dealing with the, the today's problems as well? Uh, you know, how, how, over the last 20 years, what do, you, what do you see happening from a leadership perspective in the Valley? Well, I think it's a challenge. We certainly had the rise of founder CEOs in yeah. the Valley very heavily. Um, great founder CEOs know when they don't know everything they need to know to be a great founder CEO. And I think figuring out how to make that work, whether, whether it's what Larry and Sergey did at Google, yeah. which is bringing Eric in and then, and then getting to a point where Larry was ready to lead the company, or what Mark Zuckerberg has done, which is bringing Sheryl Sandberg, who's fantastic and could have run the company herself. You know, that, that, those are great models to think about how to do that. How do you get, how do you take somebody who's got the passion to be the CEO, but maybe not all the experience they need yet, and bring them up the ramp to make them successful? I think great companies are still led by people who have a vision of what they want to do. And it's not a vision about trying to become rich before they're 30. It's a vision yeah. about changing the world in a fundamental way. So, you know, moving on to the, to the future, you've, uh, you've, you know, you've had great success in so many areas, and uh, you, you leave in 2016. You know, what's your story going forward? Yeah. So I spent a lot of time thinking about this. I mean, um, transitions in universities are long, typically more than a year, so I had plenty of time to think about it. And as I thought about what I wanted to do, I decided we really needed to think about leadership and the leadership void that existed in the public sector as well as in the private sector. Uh, that was three years ago. 
To say things have gotten worse is the biggest understatement made tonight. Things have gotten a lot worse in both, both the corporate sector as well as the, as well as the public sector. So I started to come up with an idea of, well, what do universities do? Universities educate people for the future. Why not build a system? Why not build a scholarship that would attract some of the best and most promising young people from our country and from around the world, bring them for their graduate education in whatever discipline they wanted to be in, since we need leaders across all disciplines, um, provide them with free graduate education give them leadership development and training and education, and hopefully launch them in the world to make a difference. So I, um, after I had the idea, I talked to the trustees at the university. They were enthusiastic. So I went and talked to my friend um, Phil Knight up at Nike. Yeah. And a month later, he committed $400 million to our project. You're very persuasive. Uh, yeah, well, OK, so here's Phil's part of the deal. Uh, <laughs> Phil said. Uh, I, I have two conditions. The first condition is that... Um, you didn't screw it up like you did in New York, I think. No, no. no we, yeah. I didn't screw up this one. Uh, <laughs> so Phil's two conditions were um, that the program be jointly named for Phil and myself. That's awesome. And the other, the other condition was that I agree to lead it as the initial leader. Um, he's a smart I, man. He's a smart man. It's clearly, I, I know what he had in mind. Um, so that was really a question, did I really believe in what I was proposing to him, and, and did I believe it could make a difference? So uh, we, are, we are 10 days out from the first admissions deadline for our first, for our first class of scholars, and we have 28,000 people who've started an application for 50 slots, so we'll wow. see where we end up in the end. Uh, even if we only have 8,000 completed or 5,000, we'll obviously have a very selective pool uh, and we're, it's completely global. Unlike some other scholarships who were started in earlier times, it's open to women as well as men. Um, and, and we're going to try to find people who um, have the potential to make important contributions. So you're doing world. another grand challenge uh, here. If you yeah, I it. was too young to retire. As my, my wife is fond of saying, I failed sabbatical every time <laughs> I took one. So, <laughs> You know, we're, we're coming to the end here. I, uh, just a few things I've learned through the night. And I'd like you to summarize this for the audience. Um, you know, uh, I, the, the one thing that came out clear, your talk all the way uh, to Mike Brown's, you know, people leader. Being great people leader uh, is, I think we often talk about it, but do we, really, do we really do that to really develop that? Do we really focus on the people? Do we em empower them to do the work? I think sometimes we get caught in the Captain Kirk mentality, but I, th you know, you got to beam down to the planet and leave the, everybody else up. Which, I think, this idea of great people leaders, I heard a lot of that tonight. Um, giving back, I think, the idea that uh, much of the greatest innovation now is occurring in this open source give back. Uh, the fulcrum example was amazing, and you just look at those things. People who are really committed to the future, not about making a billion dollars, but really committed to doing something special and spectacular. You know, those are inspiring things to me. What, what did you learn tonight? What do you think about? So I think we heard several times the, work, the word teamwork. People working as teams, leaders working with a team, leaders having the humility to know that they don't have all the answers, um, that they have to inspire the group to collaborate. Um, I think we also heard about empathy. I think empathy is an important characteristic in really good leaders, whether it's dealing with a disaster or empathy to understand your customer base or how your employees are thinking. Those are important concepts that really help people um, achieve as a leadership position. I, I think too often we, get, we think of the leader as above the rest of the team. The leader isn't above the rest of the team. The pyramid is upside down. The leader is supporting the team so that the entire organization can accomplish what they need to do. So I think that's a real testimony to the work that Churchill does here in bringing great leadership and great, creating great examples. Well, you're, uh, you're certainly an, uh, a real inspiration to me. I, I mean, it's been an honor to, 
to do this and give you this award. And uh, I think you can inspire us all in a, for going forward. And thank you so much for being MC tonight. And thank you all for being here. Karen and the Churchill Club, it's been an office, off, awesome night. Thank you all very much. Thank you all. Good evening. Thanks, Bill. Thank Good job. Good Don't job. forget your award. Yeah, don't forget my award.